Now let us commence our midweek meeting this evening by singing on to God's praise from Psalm number 37. Psalm number 37, and we shall take our reading to sing up at the verse Mark 3. And the tune will be Denfield. Psalm number 37 at the verse Mark 3. Set thou thy thrust upon the Lord, and be thou doing good. And so thou and the land shall dwell, and verily have food. Delight thyself in God, he'll give thine heart's desire to thee. Thy way to God commit, him trust, it bring to pass shall he. And so on to the end of the verse marked 7. Psalm number 37, verses 3 to 7, uh, to the tune Denfield, set thou thy trust upon the Lord. Now let us pray. Our gracious and ever-blessed Lord, we draw now into the courts of thy presence and before thee, only in and through the name, the mediatorship of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the one who has gone before, and the one who intercedes for us at thy right hand. We come, Eternal One, this evening at uh, this, the midweek meeting, uh, to praise Thee and to uplift Thee, uh, to set forth Thy name and crave that Thou would indeed be pleased to presence Thyself with us. We thank Thee for uh, the meeting that Thou dost set in the midst of a week of work and of labor whereby we can come and cast all of these things aside for a short while and uh, set ourselves awaiting upon thee that thou would come, that thou would bless us through thy word, and that uh, thou would indeed encourage us in the days that would remain uh, even in the week that thou hast given us upon mercy's ground. We thank thee, O Lord, that it is indeed a sign of thy people, a mark of those who profess thy name, uh, that they are found in the place where prayer is wont to be made. Ah, we are conscious that that was even the mark that set forth the Apostle Paul after the days of his conversion, uh, that he was found in that place when there were those, and they doubted even whether there was that uh, good work begun in him. 
and that they could go in and see and say, Behold, he prayed. It is indeed uh, that necessary mark of thy people that they are breathing, that they have that life in them uh, when they are found in the place where prayer is wont to be made. And it is indeed a great sadness to us that even as we are gathered here uh, around our firesides this evening, uh, that we are not indeed uh, in the place where prayer is wont to be made as a congregation of thy people. And nevertheless, uh, when we gather around thy word uh, in that place uh, where thy people are also gathering this evening, uh, that uh, thou hast promised that uh, thou would uh, indeed be unto us thy uh, God uh, of thy people, and we shall be thy people. We thank thee that uh, wherever we are, that uh, thou wilt meet with us. And uh, we praise thee afresh that thou art the one who does comfort us, uh, even in the times of the trials and the difficulties and the tribulations, the times when we are cast down, the times, O Lord, when uh, our bodies are showing the, the signs of uh, uh, decay and uh, also the signs that uh, sin has uh, come into the world and it has come into our nature. Ah, uh, but we are conscious, eternal one, that uh, thou art the one who uh, has uh, given us uh, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and so we have been given all things. Uh, we uh, pray that uh, even this evening that uh, thou would bless thy word as it goes forth here, but also in other places. We pray that uh, thou would be the one who would go forth with thy spirit, and that uh, thou would indeed enable uh, that word uh, to be made intelligible unto men and women, even those uh, who perhaps are strangers to thyself and to thy grace, those uh, who are perhaps struggling with spiritual issues, those uh, who are perhaps uh, even set aside uh, with their soul and uh, asking their soul, uh, how is it with them? And we pray that uh, thou would be pleased to uh, enlighten them by thy Spirit. And we also remember those uh, who perhaps at this time are uh, set uh, apart with illness. We pray that thou would be with them. We pray that thou would comfort them. We pray that thou would remind them that thou art the one who is the great physician. Uh, we thank thee that uh, there is indeed nothing outside of uh, the ability of our God. And uh, we pray that uh, indeed we might be mindful that nevertheless we place ourselves in subjection unto his will. So we pray that thou would uh, go before us now, that thou would accept of us, uh, that uh, thou would indeed... Uh, uh, remind us afresh that when we come to uh, read thy word, that we are indeed handling the word of the ever-living God. So all we pray now is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now we turn in the scriptures to the uh, epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. The Epistle to the Hebrews and Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Now let us hear the word of the Lord. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest." although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day of this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, 
if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also had ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto uh, the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And thus far we read in the word of God, and we pray that God will be pleased to bless this reading of his own holy and infallible word for his name's sake. Now we continue to praise God in Gaelic in Psalm number 16. Psalm number 16 in Gaelic, and uh, we read verses 8 and 9. Psalm 16 in Gaelic, verses 8 and 9, and it is to the tune Kilmarnock. Before me still the Lord I set, said it, it is so that he that ever stand at my right hand, I shall not move it be. Because of this my heart is glad, and joy shall be expressed, even by my glory and my flesh in confidence shall rest. As Psalm number 16 in Gaelic, verses 8 and 9, to the tune Kilmarnock, to God's praise.
Now would you turn with me please to that portion of God's Word that we read, the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews, and Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and we read again the words that we have in the verse that is marked 14. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest uh, that uh, is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Hold fast our profession. Now you'll notice here what Paul is doing in his epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, He is coming and he's writing to the uh, Hebrew Christians, those who had been converted from Judaism, and there was a great pressure that they would uh, give up uh, what they already had and go back uh, into the old religion and back into the old place. And he was reminding them here as he comes with with great precision and detail, and he compares all of what was there in the Old Testament. And indeed, he he says it is good. Now, you will remember what he he says about Moses. He says that Moses was faithful. Uh, He was faithful in, in all his house, but he was there as a servant. And he says, we have one who is master of the house, even Christ. And that is an example of how Paul brings uh, before those new converts uh, the superiority of Christ and the superiority of the Christian faith and the superiority of what was now in their possession. And you will remember uh, that the Christians had been put out of the synagogues because they, they had Christ. And you will remember that very often there was a very distinct um, animosity uh, from uh, the Jews towards the early Christians. And that was an example that was brought before us even in those churches in uh, Revelation. Uh, The church at Smyrna, for example, Uh, the Christians were were given up to to the Romans uh, at the behest of the Jews, and so on. Now, when Paul comes here, uh, he is speaking about uh, how the superiority, the superiority of the faith that is now in the possession of God's people is as a superiority in two distinct senses. First of all, he says, we have Christ as the Messiah. Christ is the Messiah. He is the anointed one, and therefore we have him as the head. And indeed, that is a great truth, the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, this is how, and this is why you must hold fast your profession. And that is there brought before us, and we'll see more about this in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest— And he goes on, let us hold fast our profession. And then there was the superiority because the Jews had rejected and still reject 
the New Testament Scriptures. So, there is the rejection of Christ, and there is the rejection of the New Testament Scriptures. So, that is enough even for separation. That is enough for separation. And he's saying clearly that to return uh, to the old ways and uh, to the old Judaism is a form of apostasy. Look at uh, chapter 6 and verses 4 to 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. He's saying it is serious. If you go back there is an apostasy. If you return to the old way, it is a rejection. And friends, you know, we might not, uh, of course, uh, be those who are enticed back uh, by, by Judaism. Of course not. But we might be enticed back by other things. We might be uh, asked to compromise in other ways. Maybe compromise our, our, our testimony uh, as regards the things that we, we do uh, in the church of God. There is a, a, an enticement in these days to, to lessen that, that distinctive. Uh, but even on a personal level, there is an enticement to compromise Compromise maybe with, with others who, who do not hold the same views as we do, but maybe even more to compromise with the world. And there can be that, that dragging, that attempt to drag back. Well, Paul warns us to hold fast our profession. Hold fast our profession. There are three things uh, we might consider uh, this evening as the Lord would enable us, as they are brought here um, by the Apostle Paul to uh, the Jewish converts to Christianity, uh, but we will also see that there's application for ourselves. So he's saying here, hold fast your profession. And the first thing he was saying was this, that a Christian profession does not abandon anything in, uh, that is revealed in the Old Testament. A Christian profession does not abandon anything that is revealed in the Old Testament. And of course, we would place the uh, qualifier uh, if it has not been nullified in the New Testament. So, this is what he was saying, that a Christian profession does not abandon anything in the Old Testament. You see, those who were now followers of Christ were regarded and branded as, as upstarts. They, they were newcomers. They were regarded as, as something that um, had, had come out out of a, out of a state of uh, a, a lack of um, respect for Judaism. And of course, that was not the case. Uh, indeed, the Lord Jesus Christ constantly made references that the law and the prophets speak of me, that Moses spoke of me, and so on. You see, just because they did not own the local synagogue, they were saying, well, therefore you are not uh, those who have a proper right to uh, the heavenly oracles, just because you do not own these things. And of course, we know that that was very much part and parcel of the, of the Pharisees, wasn't it? They placed their concentration upon the exactness of the law and, and upon uh, tradition and, and upon buildings and upon idols and so on. And indeed, all of those things became an idol to them. Well, what was the golden calf of their affections? Uh, the Apostle Paul was saying, is insignificant. It's unimportant when you compare it to the truth of the gospel itself. And the second part that they were saying was this, that the followers of Christ could have no part 
of the Old Testament church. They could have no part of the Old Testament church. This is why they were uh, removed from the synagogues. Because, you see, they were saying, well, this is something new. Because you have come to a new point in time, because you have started something new, therefore you have no right to claim that which is old. And, of course, the apostle was saying, it's the complete opposite of that. It's the complete opposite of that. He was saying, you, by your lack of regard of the Messiah, you, for your rejection of the truth and of the reality, you who are still there uh, looking to your traditions and your, your types and your shadows, it is you who are new. Of course, this was something that was leveled against the reformers of the Reformation. And of course, what the reformers were doing was they were going back to the truth that was founded even in the New Testament. You see, friends, we have to be careful uh, that everything that we do is dependent upon the Word of God. This is, as we say so often, the only rule of our faith and practice. Why do we think that our forefathers said that uh, in the Catechism? It was to remind us that there is an, a, a tendency, an, a tendency uh, even within our fallen nature to constantly go for that that we believe is right. Uh, that uh, our um, senses are, are, are so warped by that sin that still remains in us that we have a tendency to go for will worship. Well, no, he's saying, no, you, you hold fast your profession. And you hold fast that profession because you are not abandoning anything that was there in the Old Testament. And while there is no contradiction with the Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament is incomplete without the New Testament. Uh, that is the whole point of what he's dealing with here in verses 3 to 11 uh, in uh, chapter 4 of Hebrews. You notice when he mentions the, the various places of, of rest, he, he speaks about um, rest in relation to the Old Testament. Now, the rest, a rest is only temporary. And so he was saying that the Old Testament was just something that was temporary in the sense that it would later be fulfilled and completed by the New Testament, by that setting forth of the life which is to come. It was never meant to be a permanent fixture. Uh, the, the altar in the tabernacle and then in the temple was never meant to be there forever. Uh, the, the high priest with all of his garb, and we shall see more about that in a moment, was never meant to be there forever. It was pointing to something. Ah, you see here, this was the problem, wasn't it? There were those, and they wanted to hang on to the outward things, the ceremonies, the types and the shadows, but reject the reality. Well, the Jews did not lose their high priest when they left Judaism. That's the whole point of what Paul is saying here. He says, you might have come out of Judaism, but you did not lose your high priest. You did not lose your high priest. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Now, we were going to mention this later on, but we'll just mention it here. The high priest in the Old Testament was never given that title, the great high priest. He was referred to as the high priest, this word here, the great high priest, the, the original has, has the idea 
uh, rather, we would say, if, if we were to use it, it would be perhaps irreverent, uh, but it is scriptural. It has the idea of mega, the high priest, the great high priest. And he is saying here, you think you're leaving the high priest? You think you're missing all of that? Well, you have a great high priest. Friends, isn't that the wonderful thing as as Christians this evening? We have a great high priest. And the great high priest has offered the sacrifice himself, the perfect sacrifice, not like the types and the shadows with their, their perhaps their blemishes. Yes, the, the priests would check the lambs to see that there were no uh, major defects. I'm sure uh, the mortal men that they were, I'm sure the fallible men that they were, there were many of those lambs that got through that were defective. Now, that, of course, would not have nullified uh, what was there represented. Um, it would not have nullified that. But the idea here is that we have one who is perfect. And that is the important focus. We have one that has offered that perfect sacrifice of himself. And he continues to be our great high priest, even in glory this evening. You see, the Jewish high priest... Well, this Jewish high priest was an active high priest. There's no doubt about that. He was active. You remember his activity. Acts chapter 5. Seeking to silence the disciples. Acts chapter 7. The martyrdom of Stephen. Acts chapter 9, he, he authorized Paul's persecution of the Christians. And isn't it interesting that he attacks Paul in Acts chapter 23? Here was one that was active in all of the wrong reasons. But was he really a high priest? Well, Paul gives him the title of, of, of high priest. Uh, but you will remember what he says in Acts chapter 23. He, he speaks about him uh, as being whitened. He prays against him. Uh, he, he has that, that idea of the whitened sepulcher. Well, friends, uh, who would have uh, indeed in, in Paul's day uh, have, have thought that the apostle himself was being derogatory towards one of religion? And yet it was the truth. So this high priest that was the uh, physical high priest, uh, the one uh, who was active in all of the wrong ways, even this, this high, high priest was, was tolerant. Um, he was a, a usurper because he was redundant after the temple had been rent in, in twain, after that veil had been rent. That was a signal that this high priest was redundant. All of the old ways, the types and the shadows were now gone. You see, that, that was a representation that no man would, would enter in, uh, even into the Holy of Holies itself, uh, because the way was barred. The way was barred because there was no access. And when that veil was rent in twain, it was because our high priest has gone in. And he has gone in and he has opened up, as the apostle says elsewhere in Hebrews, uh, that uh, you aren't living way for us, even through the rent veil of his own flesh. Is it any wonder then that the apostle comes and says, let us hold fast our profession because of this? You see, there we see the high priest, and we have been studying the high priest at the monthly meetings, haven't we, uh, so, so long ago when we were meeting here. There he was with, with all of his garments. And all of his garments had a, had a significance, and they, they symbolized something. Well, Paul is saying they have all been fulfilled. 
They have all been fulfilled in Christ. And he's reminding here these New Testament believers that we still have a high priest. We still have a high priest because our needs are the same. Our needs are the same. Well, what were the needs uh, of those here in the days of Paul that are similar to ours? Well, the very fact, friends, that we have to be brought close unto the Lord. We have to be brought close unto the Lord. And he's reminding us here that, uh, that, that we have uh, need of an altar. Uh, chapter 13 and verse 10. Not an altar again to offer up sacrifice. Of course not. Never could be. He says in uh, Hebrews 13 and 10, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Now, what is that altar? Why, friends, it is the altar of Calvary, the altar of the cross. And there still needs to be the offering up of sacrifices, not actual sacrifices in the physical sense. Chapter 13 uh, of uh, Hebrews and verse 16, but to do good and to communicate forget not for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. These are spiritual sacrifices that are still demanded of his people. Ah, friends, is that so with us this evening? Are we bringing those sacrifices, those spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord as the Lord's people? Well, we have a testimony to keep. We have a testimony to keep because we still are the Israel of God, as Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 and 16. The Old Testament types and shadows are carried over into the New Testament faith. The New Testament makes more sense in relation to the Old Testament. So the first thing he was saying here was, that a Christian profession does not abandon anything revealed in the Old Testament. Well, friends, our Christian profession gives us much more than what was revealed in the Old Testament. Our Christian profession gives us much more than what was revealed in the Old Testament. Well, we do not lose anything by uh, embracing the Christian faith. We do not lose anything. Indeed, the opposite is the case. We gain. We gain. We gain what the Jews refuse to gain. We gain Christ himself. We gain the reality. We gain something past the types and the shadows. Oh, to be stuck in the types and the shadows the sacrifices that the hands would bring, the sacrifices that were solid and the sacrifices that were contaminated by the hands. You see, friends, we have indeed that great hope that is laid before us because we have one who has completed the work that we could never complete ourselves. Uh, Chapter 3 of Hebrews And verse 19 should be a warning. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Just pause here for a moment. And I say this to you. We have to remember Uh, that we should pray for all men. We have to remember that uh, we bring all men before the Lord in prayer. Now, we cannot, of course, bring uh, before the Lord in in prayer uh, those that we are forbidden to to pray for uh, in the Scriptures itself. Uh, We would not, for instance, uh, bring uh, the Satan before the Lord in prayer. How could we? We could not bring the Antichrist before the Lord in prayer. 
but we are to pray for all men. And we are to pray for God's ancient people, that they would be shown the light, and they would be given the light, the light even of salvation itself. And that in knowing him, in knowing the one who would be the redeemer of their souls, so that they would come to that saving knowledge. You know, it, 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 is, it is a different God. And we say this with all solemnity, it is a different God that we worship. Because we believe, and indeed salvation depends upon this, we believe that our God is triune. A triune God. That Christ himself is God. So pray, please, that uh, the Lord would be pleased to uh, open the eyes of his ancient people. So we are those uh, who lose nothing by embracing the Christian faith. Indeed, we gain everything. And in Christianity, we keep the high priest that is first revealed to us in the Old Testament. The difference is, that Christ is our high priest. We don't have priests. That is part of the revelation of, of God. We don't have priests. Priests are not the same um, as ministers of the gospel. Priests are those who offer sacrifices. Well, there is one sacrifice that has been offered. Priests are, are those that, uh, that come and forgive sins. Well, there is only one who can forgive sins, and it is Christ himself. Uh, so, friends, we don't have a priest, but we do have one who is a high priest, the one who was offered the sacrifice, the one who continues to give the blessing, the one who continues to pray for us at God's right hand. And Christ alone is that priest. He is the priest uh, for all of his people. And he is a man, but he is the God-man. He is a man, but he is the God-man. Uh, that's what we have there in, uh, in our text. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Notice how he's described. Jesus the Son of God. There is a reminder that we have one who is the God-man. He is Jesus, reminding us there of his humanity, reminding us there that uh, there was said to one, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But he is the Son of God. He is God manifest in the flesh. And that is the one who was now in the heavens. Ah, oh, we are thankful this evening, friends, for all of his goodness to us. He, has, he is the one that has no sins. Uh, he is the one who has no sins, as the high priest in the Old Testament had. You see that in chapter 7 and verses 26 and 27. For such a high priest became us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needed not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. When he offered up himself. He is the one that has the power of an endless life, the one who continues to make intercession for us. Well, friends, what about our altars and our sacrifices? You know, it must have been difficult here for the Jews when Paul was speaking to them uh, those who had even been converted from Judaism. You know, we have to be, we have to be careful that um, 
we deal with those who are newly converted in the way that the apostle here is dealing with these Jewish converts. You notice very patiently, and indeed that is the point of this entire epistle. Paul takes time to do this. Very, very patiently, he's explaining the difference. He's not expecting them to to know all of these things immediately. But he's explaining the difference. You see, it would have been difficult for them to understand, well, why there are now no longer sacrifices. It would have been difficult for them to to understand the the sheer simplicity of, of the Lord's Supper. All of these things. This would have been difficult for them. Uh, But friends, we are to remember that while there are terms that are used here, and Paul continues to use them, terms like altar, he's saying, well, there's no no more blood to be offered. Uh, Terms like like high priest. Well, it is a high priest that has passed into uh, the heavens. Uh, The Passover lamb is now the one who is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And you'll notice the, the apostle mentions something there in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 13 uh, and verse 16. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 16, he does mention those sacrifices. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices... God is well pleased. You see, he's keeping the language, but he's saying that the language now means something different. It means not that which is literal, but that which is spiritual. And our praises, Paul says in uh, chapter 13, we don't have time to look at it, our praises are our sacrifices. Our bodies, he says in Romans 12 and 1, are our sacrifices. Friends, we still have sacrifices to bring, but they are of the spiritual kind. And the third thing we say is this, that we have scriptural and practical reasons to hold fast our profession. Now, he is saying here um, the, the need for the profession that we have, but there are reasons why we must hold fast our profession. And the lessons are indeed wider than the ones in the context that are brought before us. Why should we let go the profession of our faith? Why would we let that go? And what would be the reason we would let it go? What would be the gain of letting go the profession of our faith? Now, the word profession here, it means acknowledgement. So it is the acknowledgement of our faith. In other words, why should we go back into a defunct form of worship? That's what he was saying here. Well, you take it into our context. Why would we go back uh, to something that is not revealed in the Scripture? You take it in relation to our salvation. Why would we go back into the world? Why would we go back into the world? Friends, we have been there. We know what it's like. We have tasted, and it has been bitter. We have uh, had an enjoyment, and it has not lasted. And indeed, that enjoyment was not an enjoyment at all, for it uh, had, had no continuation. Indeed, it left us empty. So why should we surrender living for Christ Jesus the Lord? Well, we are told that Christ has entered into the heavens. He has entered into the heavens. Now, why has Christ entered into the heavens? Well, the heavens there, uh, one of the, the, the commentators, it was I, uh, John Owen, says that the heavens there, uh, it has a twofold aspect. It has the aspect of the place where God dwells. It also has the idea of the skies itself. And I think this here is a a reference to to both of these. It's speaking about the ascension. Christ was, was there viewed as one that rose up, and he was ascending into the heavens. Now, 
Why did he ascend into the heavens? Well, it was proof that the atonement was accepted. Proof that the atonement was accepted. You see, on the cross, there as Christ was, and he he cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That that forsakenness there that uh, was displayed by uh, God uh, towards his Son upon the cross, uh, it, was, it was not an abandonment. It was not a, a, a breaking down of the relationship between the Father uh, and the Son. No, what it was, it was a withholding of the comfort It was a a withholding of that conscious comfort uh, that uh, the Father would give unto the Son. And that withholding of that comfort was so that we, as his people, might indeed enjoy that comfort even in him. But the Father is the one that accepts him into glory. There there is now that continued comfort in glory. You see, this is proof that the atonement has been accepted. This is proof, the apostle is saying, that our sins have been forgiven. This is proof that the old way could never show and the types and the shadows, that the world can never show us this evening. So why would we go back? What is there? The waters of the world, they're stagnant waters. Here is the water of life that flows, the fountain that flows. The stagnant waters of the world, oh yes, we might drink from them, we might sup from them, but what do we end with? We end with heads that are sore. He enters into the heavens to receive great glory. He enters into the heavens to receive great glory. Philippians 2 and um, verse 9 and following. Philippians 2 verse 9 and following. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, and so on. You see, Christ already had an inherent glory as the Son of God. And you read that in John chapter 17 and verse 5. But now there is an additional glory as this perfect mediator who has finished this sacrificial work here below. It is a glory that he will come and he will receive us to. John chapter 17. And I think we'll look up John chapter 17. John chapter 17 and verse 22. Of course, here we have the great high priestly prayer. John chapter 17 and verse 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. You see, even as the Father indwells in the Son, and the Son and the Father and the Spirit, and they dwell in each other, so his people dwell in him and he in them because of this union that we have with Christ. That is why he has gone into the heavens. That is why he has gone into the heavens. 
that we are already, as Paul says uh, to the church at Ephesus in chapter 2 and verse 6, we are already with him in heavenly places. And while this is, this is a spiritual reigning with him, why it is a spiritual part of his reign, nevertheless it is a real part. Now, friends, why would we go back into the world? Why would we not hold fast our profession? Why would we not hold fast the acknowledgement of our faith? And it is from heaven that Christ is said to come with clouds. That's why he has gone into heaven. Because he will come from heaven with the clouds at his second coming. At his second coming. We have said this before. We delight in saying it again because it is uh, an important fact. The New Testament Christians, those that Paul here was writing to, those Jewish converts, uh, those that he would write to at Rome and Galatia, those that John would write the Revelation to, was the last book of, of the Bible, they lived with the belief that Christ was already coming. John mentions that in Revelation chapter 1. He says, Behold, he cometh. Present tense. Now, friends, if we had Christians today and they had that same belief and they lived with that same belief and they lived their lives in accordance with that same belief, we would have Christians who would be markedly different than we have. Knowing that Christ, expecting Christ at any time, Christ is presently in heaven. He is praying for us as a high priest, as an advocate, as a mediator with the Father, thus enabling us to overcome every opposition of life. Friends, you're battling with the world. You're battling maybe with, with sin. Well, are you looking at the sin? Are you looking at the world? Are you fixing your eyes upon it? Or are you fixing your eyes upon the one who is our advocate? He is the antidote. He is the motive. And the motive is that we have the Spirit of God indwelling in us. That should be a motive not to sin. That should be a motive to keep us away from the world. That should be a motive uh, in... Uh, not loosening the ties of the firmness of our faith in the things that are laid down in the Scriptures to us. And the Apostle Paul, you have heard me quote this very often in Romans 8 and 37, says of the Christian that they are more than conquerors. Now, why are they more than conquerors? They are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. In other words, through the one who dwells in us. 1 John 5 and 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Even our faith overcometh the world. What does it mean our faith overcometh the world? Does it mean our belief overcometh the world? Does it believe that uh, what we think and what we believe makes us more than conquerors? No. Well, what is our faith? Well, our faith is our profession, holding fast our profession. What is our profession? Our profession is that which overcomes the world. It can't be our faith because our faith is often weak. If, if the overcoming of the world depended upon the strength of our faith, we would never overcome. But it is Christ, because he is our profession. He is our faith. He is the one 
who dwelling in us makes us more than conquerors. And because he conquers, his people conquer. These things being so, our friends, do not let go your profession. There's no reason why you should. No reason why you should, regardless of the circumstances. You see, the, the, the church in Smyrna, the Christians were persecuted. They were put to death. They were treated as the outcasts in society. They didn't look for respectability from the, the, the council or the, the government or the, the parliament of Smyrna. They didn't look for it. They didn't expect it because their citizenship was in heaven. Hold out when every last temptation is before you. What are you to do, said Paul? When the, the, the Jewish rulers come and they tell you you're, you're going to hell because you have apostatized into Christianity, what are you to do? Well, you're to do what he says elsewhere. You're to press towards the mark. You're not to say, well, we'll, we'll withdraw from the race. We'll not run now. I'm too old to run. No, he says, you press towards the mark. And friends, it is that pressing towards the mark. It is holding fast our profession, which is Christ Jesus. That means that we endure, that we triumph, that we conquer in him. Amen. And we pray that God will bless these thoughts to us for his name's sake. Let us pray. Our gracious and eternal Lord, as we bow before thee now, we are conscious that there is much in this world that would take us away from thee and from that good hope that is within us. We pray that we might be those who continue to battle and to press towards the mark, that we would be those who, because we would see then that we have a great high priest, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, that we would hold fast our profession, that we would hold fast our faith, that we would hold fast him. So, gracious Lord, we pray that thou would continue with us now, that thou would receive of us, that thou would prepare us in all that lies ahead, even in the duties of this week. And all we ask is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Now we close by singing to God's praise in Psalm number 121. Psalm number 121, and it is to the tune French, a psalm that is entitled A Song of Degrees. A Song of Degrees. I to the hills will lift mine eyes from whence that come my need. My safety cometh from the Lord who heaven and earth had made. Thy foot he'll not let slide, nor will he slumber that thee keeps. Behold, he that keeps Israel, he slumbers not, nor sleeps. And so on to the end of the psalm. Psalm number 121, to the tune French, I to the hills will lift mine eyes. I too.
Now, the following are the intimations. The broadcast, God willing, uh, shall go out on the Lord's Day um, and shall be there for uh, viewing at 12 noon and 6 p.m. And do please remember the, uh, the courts of the church, the session and the deacon's courts, as they um, ha- will have some plans to make over the ensuing weeks. Do bear that uh, in your prayers, please. And all these intimations are subject to the will of the Lord. Let us close now with the Lord's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.